look at this tiny little thing. 256 cores in this? It's, it's impossible. And yet it's not, thanks to Gigabyte Engineering. This is a 2U4 node system. We've taken a look at those in the past, but what makes this one unique is how tiny these nodes are. Look at this motherboard, and it's not really sacrificing much of anything. We've got two X16 slots here, we've got eight memory channels, and this is our AMD Epic Milan CPU socket. There's actually two revisions of this, A00 and 100. The 100 is the Epic Rome version, this is the Epic Milan version. I know, I know, SP5 is the new hotness, but these are gonna be in service for a long time. I mean, macroeconomic conditions notwithstanding, AMD is gonna sell every SP3 CPU they manufacture. I mean, they don't use a lot of power and you can get them from eight to 64 cores, what's not to love? And this chassis will let you pack in four 64 core CPUs, but also the lesser expensive P variant. Yeah, single socket, you can use four single socket CPUs in this configuration. This is for edge compute and that sort of things, but I thought we could have a, a different conversation about shopping for servers and how you pick. It's like, do you need compute? Do you need memory capacity? Do you need high availability? Do you need storage? What do you need? See, the cool thing with Epic is that it gives you a lot of flexibility to do a lot of different things. It has 128 PCIe lanes. You can use some of those PCIe lanes to connect and, uh, and do a dual socket configuration. So if you're doing mostly compute, the benefits from having a lot of local compute where one CPU has a quick path to another CPU, then uh, it makes sense to get a dual socket system. If you're doing something where your jobs can be split up a little easier in software and the job can live local and it doesn't really need to get at the memory or anything else in other nodes, you can have a setup like this where this is a standalone computer in this form factor and you've got the access to the memory here, you know, up to two terabytes, but really as a practical matter, 512 gigabytes to one terabyte, I would say. And you've got your X16 slots here for IO. You've got an OCP2 slot because this is an older design as opposed to OCP3. Don't worry, Gigabyte has another chassis I'll be taking a look at that's the dual socket version, but it's quite a bit bigger. This thing is positively Lilliputian, which is an extremely impressive engineering achievement. But anyway, I digress. And you look at this and we've got, okay, we've got dual M.2. Uh, we've got a connection here for the front NVMe on this chassis because believe it or not, this 2U chassis does have four U.2 slots at the very front. You can run SATA in those as well, but it gives you four PCIe lanes so you can connect up storage or whatever you need at the front. There's actually even another riser here that can be used for breakout cables or other designs, but that's just really down to our Gigabyte MZ12 HD0 motherboard, which can show up in a couple of different chassis and a couple of different configurations. For the rear I.O. for each blade, you've got your two half-height, half-length X16 slots. You've got your USB 5 gigabit, two 1 gig Intel 350 NICs, your onboard uh, out-of-band management, and your VGA connection. So adding a 10 gig or 25 gig interface to this, via the OCP2 module, pretty easy. You have a module like this. This is an Intel X550. Again, X550, older design. These are available in X710. If you wanna add dual Intel 10 gig NICs, boom, there you go. If you wanna add Mellanox, you know, connect X3, 4, 5 to this platform, not a problem because those are available in the OCP2 format. So looking at this system, who is this system for? What's their minimum specification? borrow a phrase from Tech Tech Potato, which if you haven't seen, you should definitely get subscribed. Dr. Cutrus is uh, doing lots of cool, fun things, and it's sort of exciting. Plus also, we got to go see uh, Quantum Computers at IBM a while ago, and that was fun. And maybe I'll get to do something with that content at some point. But yeah, fun times. Anyway, does it make sense to pack in two terabytes and 64 cores in a configuration like this? No, not really. This is really sort of kind of meant for edge compute, but this is also the ideal form factor for a cluster, which is probably why Gigabyte went through the trouble of certifying this platform and there are other similar platforms for VMware. But not just VMware, you could run a Windows cluster with this, you could run pretty much any kind of cluster. There's not a lot of local storage here, so we're not really necessarily talking about hyper-converged clusters. Hyper-converged clusters, if you're not familiar, we've done some videos on this in the past, is you have a bunch of computers that have local storage, 
for important stuff other than just their boot operating system, the stuff, the, the jobs that they're running, plus compute, plus memory, but they work together cooperatively. The software sort of manages the cluster. Azure, Microsoft Azure, they have Edge Compute now that works pretty good with just a two node configuration. That's kind of the exception. A lot of VMware enthusiasts will pop in and say, well, technically you can have a VMware cluster with just two nodes. And that is almost not a lie. The way in which that's a little bit of a lie is that you need a witness appliance running somewhere. It's not necessarily running jobs or anything, but the witness gives you the quorum, gives you the thing to say, okay, one of the nodes went down, the other node actually needs to do something. You can run the witness on a Synology NAS, for example, so you don't really need too much horsepower. You can also run the witness appliance in the VMware cloud, although they were just sort of starting to get that ramped up when Broadcom bought them, and I don't know of anybody actually doing that in production, but I'm I am very small fish in very large pond, so I'm sure there are people out there doing that. In this case, because Edge Compute, and it's not really meant for local storage, this design is about high availability. To that end, you know, we do have redundant power supplies. There are two 1200 watt, 80 plus power supplies that are tiny, so tiny, easy weensy little power supplies. For a high availability configuration, this would also be used with a SAN, a storage area network, meaning your virtual machines and everything else would be running on a SAN. So you really would use your PCIe connectivity here for everything up to and including InfiniBand. Now, this is just basically how you connect your disks. If I'm helping you connect the dots and understanding how these things work together, this gives you your high availability compute, your virtual machines and your servicing clients running, you know, uh, virtual machines, web servers, uh, sharing the load, maybe you don't have anything special. VDI, usually you would have a little bit of graphics acceleration and you could do some lightweight VDI, like you could put in one or two very small half height graphics accelerators that would give you, you know, eight or 16 uh, clients per node. So you could do a little bit of virtual desktops with this, but this is probably not what this is really meant for. The sweet spot for this configuration is probably something like 32 core CPUs, 512 gigabytes of memory per node, probably 25 gig, dual 25 gig, or 100 gig Ethernet interfaces. You can do InfiniBand, that's, that's okay too, but probably something like that for your storage area network. And then you have the 10 gig or 1 gig interfaces for your actual virtual machines. In terms of VMware, this is pretty much the ideal VMware cluster because you've got four nodes. You could lose one entire node and still have an extra node. And you can do hyperconvergence with this because you have two M.2 and one U.2 that is accessible per node. You have four U.2 at the front. Each one of those is mapped to one of the four nodes. This layout and power footprint makes it an ideal standby system, failover system, remote system, something like that, especially when you combine it with some sort of sand. If you're running a spinning rust sand with mechanical hard drives, that dual 25 gig interface is plenty for you. It's not going to matter. Heck, even dual 25 gig is enough for all but the very latest generation SSD SANs as well. If you are running an SSD SAN or something like that, then uh, maybe InfiniBand makes a little bit more sense for you to do your configuration, but hey, Everybody's got to start somewhere. You don't necessarily need that. You can, there are still people that are rocking surprisingly large clusters on dual 10 gig interfaces, even over copper and not fiber. It's a little surprising, but it is doable and the performance is surprisingly good as long as you get plenty of memory to act as a read cache for those things. VMware, of course, is doing away with their SSD read caching. That's, there are third-party products you can get that'll do that. So you could run your, your boot drive or your OS drive and then use an M.2 or U.2 for an SSD cache, or it's basically a read cache for your virtual machines, but that's kind of going the way of the Dodo with VMware. For the Azure role, I would love to get my hands dirty with Azure and the new stuff that Microsoft just showed off at Ignite for Edge Compute, because I think this chassis would be a particularly good fit for that, looking at it on paper, but I haven't taken that for a spin yet. What I have taken for a spin on this chassis is IBM's OpenShift, which is awesome. That's a sort of a developer perspective though on OpenShift. There's a lot of different roles you can run with OpenShift. And I've also run uh, Proxmox. Now Proxmox is the pedestrian setup with this. Turbo Boost works great. You can run a newer Linux kernel. Seamlessly moving virtual machines between uh, nodes on this cluster is no problem. If you wanted to do something hyper-converged and have local ZFS, you can, but you don't have a ton of storage. You're actually gonna wanna take a closer 
look at the other Gigabyte chassis that we're gonna look at, which is a little bigger than this one, this dual socket. That one's gonna be a much better choice if you do hyper-converged infrastructure because each node has a lot more uh, U.2 access in the front, but it's a, you know, the chassis is twice as big. This thing's only half depth. I mean, look, look, look at this. This is, you could run this under your coffee table and it would be completely fine. It's low cost, it's low headache, it's relatively low complexity for what it is. This node is identical to this node. There's no left and right half distinction. There's no this motherboard versus that motherboard distinction. Every single one of these is the MZ12 HD0. So from a spare parts and redundancy and reliability standpoint, it's really pretty good. If you're a hyperscaler and you're doing something with different customers and different nodes and different configurations, it's very easy to manage these individually like as if they are physically completely isolated and separate machines. That is great. It's fantastic that you can do that. For my test configuration, I've been running both the 7402P, which is a 24 core processor with 64 gigabytes of memory and a quad channel configuration. And the performance was stellar. I mean, even though you can run eight channels of memory with that 7402P, and there are definitely some workloads you should do that, the 7402P at a quad channel configuration isn't bad, and Milan is even better. Milan can actually handle a six channel configuration with no performance penalties. Those Zen 3 cores really are a significant improvement over the Zen 2 cores. It's not just the cache and everything else. Well, it depends on your workload a little bit, but it is a significant improvement. The fans are also modular, and even though the blue tab suggests they're not hot swap replaceable, you can hot swap and replace them. You wanna switch fans really quickly because this thing does depend on having good airflow through the chassis. It'll limp along with two fans, but you don't want to. Just for maintenance reasons, I will share that there is one extra hidden cooling fan located here in the chassis. It's sorta of buried, sorta of hard to get to, but it provides cooling for your U.2 in addition to the fans that are built into your power supply. So when you replace your power supply, you also replace the power supply fans, not really a big deal. You can also see that Gigabyte's got a little bit of special sauce. I mean, I'm sure if you're gonna order a bunch of these, like, oh my gosh, I've got a million dollar order. Talk to Gigabyte. You'd be surprised how willing they are to help you customize your configuration. This IO board back here, it doesn't necessarily connect to everything on the motherboard, like I was saying, that second U.2 connection, for example. But if you wanted to add, say, a cellular backup interface for out of band management over cellular, you could do that with the headers that are available in this chassis. It really would not take very much engineering at all. Now I've been working on some Red Hat OpenShift content for a while, and I keep going sort of back and forth on that because I kind of like OpenShift, but I seem to be the odd man out with this. I like OpenShift for hyper-converged storage, and I like bolting on ZFS to Red Hat, and that ZFS is not officially supported on Red Hat, and you're, you kind of don't want to draw the attention of, of Oracle. Like there's this, you just, you just don't want to, you just don't want Oracle involved if you're IBM. I kind of get it. Don't provoke the Borg! But I like using ZFS for hyper-converged storage when I'm talking about OpenShift clusters and an OpenShift solution. But I also like really combining the software from Equinix called Tinkerbell, which lets you configure these. Like I can just feed the MAC addresses of these four nodes into a spreadsheet and add it to my existing infrastructure. And then when I boot these systems, it will enroll them to set up the operating system according to something that I have in a text file. And this is kind of like infrastructure as code, except instead of configuring an Amazon EC2 instance or something in Azure, it's actually configuring bare metal. And this is sort of the future. When you are going to run Azure at the edge and some of the new products from Microsoft, they're letting you assimilate your hardware into Azure and manage it in Azure. Because that is the future, like having those management tools on whatever you got at the edge plus also the good stuff in the cloud because the cloud providers are gonna get first crack at all the goods, like it's a couple of more product cycles and between Microsoft and Amazon and everybody else, they're gonna get first crack at all the new products, all the new processors, all the latest and greatest InfiniBand, all of that. And if you want that, if your product needs that level of awesome product, you're gonna probably have to get it from the cloud. And then after the cloud providers have bought everything they can stand to buy, then is that, you know, that's when it's gonna to go to people that are only buying a few million dollars of equipment at a time or less. 
But the magic really isn't the hardware. The magic is the software. The fact that you can take four independent computers here and combine them into a cluster and do interesting stuff with it. I mean, look, because this is a single socket configuration, AMD is willing to sell you the same processor quite a bit less expensively because it doesn't have to qualify the CPU to fit in a dual socket configuration. And if you have you know specific questions and you just wanna bounce stuff off the wall with an internet rando, you can at the level one forums, although probably the person that's actually gonna sell you these should be able to talk about them competently, but it always helps to do your homework. And I like doing my homework. And this has been my homework on the Gigabyte H242Z11. What do you wanna see in terms of orchestration and cluster management and all this other kind of stuff? Because this might be the platform that lets me do it. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level 1 forums.